Okay. Welcome back. I hope you all enjoyed the lovely lunch. Uh, you're guaranteed if you work here to gain the Karen 15. Um, just to let you know, for those online, um, the Q&A feature uh, is not working, so continue to use the chat feature, which it seems like most people have found. Um, and I hope you all enjoyed the tour of the campus. It's uh, beautiful up here. It's a beautiful day. Luckily, we, aren't, we don't have the rain. So just a few housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, this session is being conducted both live and in webinar format. For those signed in virtually, please know that all the videos will be turned off and the microphones will be muted. Um, again, Q&A feature I just mentioned. <clears throat> we are trying to allot time at the end of each presentation to allow for your questions. And again, if we can't get to your questions, we'll have somebody who will follow up with you. No, I did that. There we go. Okay, again, as a reminder, today's session is worth a total of five AMA PRA category one CE credits and five APA continuing education credits. Again, I wanna thank the American Society of Addiction Medicine and CE Go for partnering with us to offer these credits. In order to receive these credits, you will need to complete the post-event evaluation on your CE Go dashboard. And once you complete that evaluation, uh, those CEs will be available immediately. Um, additionally, um, as I mentioned prior to lunch, these recordings and PowerPoint slides will be available approximately 28 days after uh, the <laughs> symposium is completed. Uh, so it's important to note that for our attendees, you must be in attendance in person or virtually for the entirety of the program to receive your credits. Uh, for our virtual friends, each of your sessions has a timestamp to track attendance. I do APA credits. I know how APA is about making sure you're here for the entire thing. So, <clears throat> okay. I'd now like to introduce you to our next presentation by Dr. Ellen Smith. Dr. Ellen Smith retired after 30 years of teaching and practicing in family medicine education in the Harrisburg area. Since she retired, she has spent a lot of time learning about adversity and how to bounce back and become more resilient. She has developed a tool called the Personal Resilience Planner, which takes the above concepts and provides a practical way to look at strengths, trauma responses, resilience, and how to progress in these areas over time. Welcome, Dr. Smith. Did you notice that you'll get your credits in 28 days? And there are other things that happen around here for 28 days? Really? I'm so glad to be here. Um, I wanna give you just a little background. Uh, Dr. Taffy Anderson, who's an OBGYN and addiction medicine specialist at Hershey was planning to give this presentation, but unfortunately she had a family emergency. And so as we do as colleagues, she picked up the phone and said, Ellen, can you do this? we know each other from a variety of places. So I'm very happy to be here. However, there will be occasion that I will say this is not my area of expertise because it's not my area of expertise because it's hers. And I will do what I can, but not give you things I don't know anything about. So you heard about me and all my medical things and the like, but let me tell you some more things about me. I, had, I have a son who had substance use disorder at about age 18. He... Um, Fortunately, got care and fortunately is in, um, is in remission, fortunately didn't have any relapses and fortunately uh, never went to prison, never went to a true suicide attempt. We got pretty close a couple of times um, and I'm very thankful for that. And what that also did for me was to get me into Al-Anon. I continue to be in Al-Anon and find it immensely helpful. So I wanna let you know about that. I also spend some time every day in at a trauma-informed preschool. Um, you guys are all doing good things. And being in a trauma-informed preschool is good things, but very challenging. And I just want to mention that. Um, a number of you know about ACEs, so I have an ACE score of four. So you know where I stand. So let's find out who are you. I'm going to ask, if you wish, feel free to not raise your hand, um, to 
Tell me who you are. Anybody here a psychiatrist? Anybody here in the mental health profession? Whatever you define that as. Anyone here in primary care? Anyone here in something else that you want to mention? Pharmacist. Pharmacist? OBGYN, fantastic. I can't tell you anything about OBGYN other than I've cut other than that I've caught a hundred babies and one of them was double footling breach between Lancaster and Harrisburg. That was pretty impressive. How many of you know a little bit about ACEs? How many of you know a lot about ACEs? Okay, well, Julie, we're done. They all know about it, right? You all said you know about it. Okay. So today we're going to do a case report. We're going to talk about ACEs. We're going to talk about PACEs. How many know about PACEs? Wow, one new thing you're gonna learn. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about trauma-informed care. How many know about trauma-informed? Probably about half, I would guess. So I wanna talk first and foremost about your safety. I want you to feel very comfortable, including the folks on the uh, virtual end. If for any reason you don't feel safe or you feel uncomfortable or you feel overwhelmed, um, feel free to step away. Um, I won't tell anybody if your face is not on the screen and she can't see the screen. So you're good for those who are virtual. If you have to step away, if you have to play a game or two of solitaire on your phone, do what you need to do. You can look at my presentation later. You can't take care of yourself later, right? Okay, let's talk about a gentleman. This is, an, this is a case study from Dr. Ann Dorney. She's in Skowhegan, Maine. I spent five months doing locum tenens up there. It's a family practice center. Skowhegan is on the west end of Maine, not the rich end, not the, not the end that has all sorts of services, but the end near Canada where there's great amount of poverty, there's great amount of substance use and just a really hard place to live, but a special place because they're meaners. Um, but this was also the time about 15 or 20 years ago when pain was considered to be the fifth vital sign. Does anybody remember that? Yeah. And so what did we say? We had vital signs. We had blood pressure. What do you do? Control it. We had a pulse. Control it. A temperature. Control it. A fifth vital sign. Pain. Control it. That's what we heard again and again and again. So those of you who are younger than, however, are going, huh? I wanna set the stage for you. So this is a middle-aged man that, I'm gonna just use the word Anne, Dr. Dorney knew. She was also a, a legislator in the, in the state legislature. Slature. Um, he, he, she knew him well. Um, he came in multiple times, about once a week with somatic complaints like back pain, kidney stones, upset stomach, injury, stress, yada, yada, yada. He was with some frequency given pain medications because remember fifth vital signs and his follow through was often spotty. He'd be invited to come back at a certain time and he didn't. And his A score, which she was just starting to use was 10 out of 10. We'll get a little further into that in a minute. She did the A score, she sat down with him. She talked about it and they both wept. A lot of wept because a lot of weeping, better English. Um, and so the patient didn't show up for about three months later and he happened to be seeing another provider. And there was, it was a visit that was appropriate to give pain pills at that time. And, she, and he said, I don't want pain pills. I'm trying to improve my life, not worsen it. I would call that an epiphany, okay? That can be a religious thing, but we have patients who have epif epiphanies and again, I'm coming from a family medicine point of view, so I'm gonna give you those examples, but they'll make sense. Sometimes you have a patient who has diabetes and doesn't eat too particularly well, and they come in one day and they're telling you they're eating well, correctly, whatever. Huh? Huh? That's an epiphany. Don't miss those epiphanies, whatever business you're in. So adverse childhood experiences. This is a CDC definition are potentially traumatic events that occur in childhood, zero to 18. Sometimes, sorry, zero to 17. Sometimes you'll hear less than 18. That's the same thing. 
So how did we get to the ACE study? It didn't start with the ACE study. A lot of people go, oh, it started with the ACE study. It didn't. Vince Felitti, who was an intern, I think he's retired now, an internist at Kaiser Permanente, and you might remember Kaiser uh, was one of the first that is a health plan as well as an insurance plan. We see that all the time now, but we didn't see that much. I think Geisinger was the first around here. And Bob, Bob Anda from the Centers for Disease Control was an epidemiologist. Um, Dr. Felitti did an obesity clinic, 286 patients at Kaiser Permanente. And 50% of the patients dropped out of the study in spite of significant good quality weight loss. Does that make sense? Well, one of the questions he asked was, what was the age of your first sexual encounter? Um, I can't tell you exactly how, how old he was at that time, but I'm gonna guess he was about 50. So he had a few, you know, a few rodeos behind him. And many, many, many said numbers that are in single digits, five, six, seven, your first sexual encounter. Single digits? Are you kidding me? And then they did the full A score and found high A scores. So um, they did this and people laughed at them, just said, baloney, you're mistaken, it's bad. It's not well done in any a number of reasons. And back then that made sense the way things looked. So they said, we have to do a big study. We have to prove this beyond a reasonable doubt. We have to make it statistically significant. Sorry about the, the side, but this is the original ACE study, which you might've heard of others. This, I'm gonna use the term original. This was published in 1998 by Kaiser Permanente. The same people, Vince Felitti, Bob Anda, and some others, looking at approximately 17,000 patients. And um, about, uh, sorry, greater than 50% had some college education. 100% of them were insured. This is where it comes in. If they're a Kaiser patient, they have to be insured because they're insured by Kaiser. So most of them were employed. Um, some got insurance with like a family member, so weren't employed, but the, the majority of them were employed. And about 80 to 90% were Caucasian, okay? So, and, and generally well off. So I want you to think, and I'm gonna ask you to think and think and think. If you don't wanna think, ignore it. Think about a couple of your patients. Are most of them white? Are most of them well off? Are most of them having some college? Are most of them insured? And again, only you can do this for yourself. But at least for my practice, that wasn't the case. So do you have a pointer or no? No pointer, okay. So there's 10 aces. And I'm gonna point you to the top, which is the categories of ACEs. Abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction. And how do you look at this? Look at abuse and neglect as what happens to a child. So we have a child, they get abused or they get neglected. And of course, uh, physical, emotional, sexual abuse, physical, emotional neglect. Then we look at household dysfunction. This is what happens around the child. Okay, and I'm gonna give a couple of caveats from then to now to help you understand. But these are the exact categories that we were originally used. So one is mental illness. Mental illness in the family, treated, untreated, doesn't matter, mental illness. Mother treated violently, domestic violence. That's what we looked at before. We now look at violence in the family. Male, female, 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 male, any of the above. Some people are being treated violently in the household. That's what it's looked at now. Divorce. Divorce was originally the first um, idea that they looked at, but now we think about divorce, separation, single parents, and that type of situation. An incarcerated relative, somebody in the household is incarcerated. And then last but not least, we're here today to talk about substance abuse. And I think everybody knows this, but I'm gonna specifically substance abuse, including alcohol use disorder. So I know you can't see this and, and I, I just want you to know, I'm gonna read one or two of them to you. This is an original, 
this is uh, allowed. This is an original ACE score questionnaire, and I'm just going to read them to you. Um, the first line is, while you were growing up during your first 18 years of life, number one, did a parent or other adult in the household often swear at you, insult you, put you down, or humiliate you, or act in a way that made you afraid that you might be physically hurt? The second question is, did a parent or other adult in the household often push, grab, slap, or throw something at you, or ever hit you so hard that there were marks or that you got injured? So that's just a flavor for some of the ACE questions, because I think most all of us have heard of this ACE score, and I want to dig it a little bit deeper here so that you can have a better flavor of what it's about. Um, so now we have more ACEs. And um, has anybody heard of the Philadelphia ACE study? This is a really important study. They, they subbed out a couple of things and subbed in a couple of things, and they're marked by the red asterisk. Foster care, a child who was ever in foster care gets a one. Secondly, witness to violence. So that would, you know, could be the domestic violence in the house, but any witnessing to violence, whether it's on their street or whether they're at grandma's house or whatever. Uh, neighborhood safety trust deemed unsafe and untrustworthy or discrimination and racism, which I think is a really key one because there's a significant systemic racism. Um, and so that's a, um, th those are some of the Philadelphia ACE study questions. And you'll, we'll see that the outcomes with that in just a minute. And there's some others, but I want to point out the top one, COVID-19. Anybody here not go through COVID? Anybody here not ever hear, heard of COVID or, right? 100%, 100%. Anybody here not affected by COVID? Probably not, but there might be a few people out there. I'm not sure where you'd live, but it happened to everyone, everywhere. And so it can be a really big ace. And you probably are still seeing its effects on people. And if you're not, you might not be asking. And I, I don't mean to, to be pushing you, but I wanna push you enough for you to go, hey, huh, let me think about that. So with the ACE study, more than 50% of people in the original ACE study from Kaiser, from California, had at least one, one ACE. And let me just specify, you get one point if you've been sexually abused once or 500 times. It's per category. And so I think that's important. And a lot of people have different opinions on that. I'm just going to say that's the way it is. Um, if you have one ACE, you're more likely to have more than one ACE. There's lots of other articles out there. If you want to see a lot of articles, just put in a study. You'll find a lot. Here is what I think is the most significant. The life expectancy among populations with six or more ACEs is 20 years shorter than that of populations with none. Okay. want you to know this is not a cause and effect study. This is a corollary study. So if you have six or more ACEs, if, if the people that 17,000 people had six or more ACEs, their life expectancy was 20 years less, okay? But you know, being in substance use work, that the outcomes for folks who are substance users is poor, right? But when you treat them, it gets better. And I'll just say, I don't know all the details of that information, but I know that in general. So this is just, if you have six or more, you have a, a poor life expectancy. I have a friend who I present with, and she says, I have a six A score, and by God, I'm not planning to live six, 20 years less because I got to double my children. <laughs> so, um, but that's really profound. And it's 170,000 people, so it's statistically significant. So just a couple of things. I'm going to hit the big ones here. Um, uh, top right, le uh, 11 times increase. Drug abuse, if you have four or more ACEs, 11 times. We look over here, earlier today, there was a talk about um, suicide, 14 times increase in the number of, uh, having had suicide attempts, if you have four or more ACEs. So um, really important. These are some other, other results, other conditions that result um, or are related to higher ACE scores. Some of these are not surprising, some of them are. So I wanna give you a, a dose response evaluation of 
childhood experiences, ACEs, compared to alcoholism. And so we look, um, you have to bear with me, I have to pretend like I have a pointer. The bottom, it says the A score, and this is gonna be pretty consistent across the time we're gonna have the A score at the bottom. And then from brown is a, Z, a score of zero, green is an A score of one, and you can see that up here, um, all the way up to four plus. So then we look on the left, and that's the percent of folks who are alcoholic when they have a different A score. So you can see, and I'm gonna round these numbers, people who have an A score of zero out a 2% chance of alcoholism. People who have an A score of four plus have, an a, have a risk of alcoholism of about 16%. So eight times different with alcoholism. We see this across the board. If I gave you one, or if I could have found one that was substance use, we would have seen the same thing, but that's buried somewhere. So now I wanna get into um, some recent studies. Kaiser's the original study we talked about. The Philadelphia ACE study is the second one and the Dauphin County study is the third one. Um, so what's the Dauphin County? Uh, I don't know if any of you know Randy Yeager, but um, she and I present a lot. She's the director of human services in um, the Harrisburg, in Dauphin County. And, we invited, and they were employees, so they were invited and expected to attend a showing of the resilience film. We also had people from the community and we had um, Hershey Med Center students and some other groups. And all of these folks were welcomed to participate by doing an ACE score, this, the form that I showed, almost the form that I showed you earlier. They were welcome to participate. They were encouraged to not participate if they didn't want to. It was anonymous, it was voluntary. We were actually surprised. We got pretty, we got a lot of results, but um, but those are all in there. So Dauphin County is gonna be people who worked for Dauphin County, the lay public, and a couple of other groups like the students. And so um, again, on the bottom is the A score. Left, A score of zero. Middle, A score of one to three and right is a score of four more. And hopefully you can see up there, we're gonna actually start with the original, the yellow. The original ACE study, and again, I'm gonna round these, people with zero ACEs were just shot about 50%. People with, again, yellow, one to three ACEs, about 45%, and then four more ACEs, 7%. So basically the original ACE score not a whole lot of people who have a really high ACE score. And then we look at Philadelphia. And, and if you decide you want to look up the Philadelphia ACE study, just write Philadelphia ACE study and you'll find it. Um, I think it's, it's from the Health Federation of Philadelphia. Um, so next is Philadelphia. Look at purple this time. So with Philadelphia, 30% of folks um, have an A score of zero. So that's almost 20% 20, 20 less. Then we get into the one to three, 48%. And then we get into the four or more, 22%. So, and then finally the Dauphin County, and again, not double blind placebo control, just we ask the people to fill it out. But we look at Dauphin County and we see 40% of people have an A score of zero. I will tell you that when we separated out the Hershey Medical Center students, that went up. The medical students at Hershey have pretty low A scores. Um, then when we get to the one to three for Dauphin County, again, green, it's 40%. And then we get into the four plus for Dauphin County, it's 20%. So I don't know what your population is, but if you worked in Philadelphia, or if you worked, maybe if you worked in Dauphin County, but let's just leave it at Philadelphia, 22% of your patients on average would have an A score of four plus. That's a lot of that's a lot of aces, and and you've seen what happens with aces. So, what is the science of aces? And I'm going to be pretty brief about this because I think, based on what I've heard, you know this. But aces are now a consensus, looking at high doses of adversity, particularly cumulative adversity. So, one ace versus ten aces you see a lot more adversity. During early life, critical times makes for difficult outcomes. However, 
there are some buffering and I can't remember exactly what was said in the last lecture, but I believe that he said we have buffering things. Um, and I don't remember what the buffering was, but in this case, we can have buffering by trusted, nurturing, caregiver, and safe, stable environments. We know that having one, one safe, stable person in a child's life, not including the parents, but one person, who might that be? Nana, a teacher, um, a therapist, uh, a coach, any number of those, makes a difference in terms of outcomes, one. And so, um, I will just say that you guys are really, really important because you might be the one and you might not know that you're the one or I might be the one as the family doctor, but I might not know. So what do you all do? You show up, you show up every day and you show up with your best self. Perfect. Um, it can affect brain development. We're gonna get in that in just a second. There's some genetics involved and ultimately this can lead to the toxic stress response. So everybody know about the toxic stress response? Show of hands. You know why I'm making you raise your hands. Can't fall asleep when you're raising your hands. But... <laughs> so um, positive stress, brief increases in heart rate, mild elevations and stress hormone levels. Trying to stay up, stay awake for this presentation. Definitely, hopefully in the positive stress. Listening and trying to learn, hopefully in the positive stress. Tolerable, serious stress temporary or relatively temporary buffering buffering that could be you know your neighbor doing this no i'm just kidding uh let me go back to the green that might be an athlete so positive stress an athlete with supportive parents and a supportive coach at a big game and maybe this is you know this is the the hit that's gonna end the game or win the game kind of thing okay then tolerable, let's think about somebody who's going to their first job. Anybody here been to a first job? Anybody here been nervous on their first job? Right. So this would be an example, like first job, your family says, add a girl, add a boy, right? You have the clothes that you need to wear. You don't just have a t-shirt and, and shorts, if that's not the appropriate attire. You've got what you need to wear. That's tolerable stress. It's hard but it's not intolerable. But toxic stress is prolonged, stress response, absence of protective environment. So let's take that first job again. What about the first job? And the family says, you will never make it. You are no way gonna be an X, Y, Z. You're a loser. And the boss goes, I can't believe they hired you. And oh, by the way, you don't have the right clothes still. Okay, that's really stressful. And those are minor. You know, I'm not talking about the really major things of war and death from pandemics and other things, um, but that kind of gives you a sense. And so um, keep that in mind. Okay, this is, this is brains from the family doctor's point of view. The last lecture was fantastic and he had pictures of MRIs and everything. Way too complex for me. Um, I'm gonna give it to you, um, brains, Family Medicine 101. I'm gonna ask you to look. I'm gonna talk about what happens in the brain when people have a lot of ACEs. Bottom right, hippocampus. Anybody know why it's called the hippocampus? It looks like a horse, right. So the hippocampus, the job of the hippocampus is to take short-term memory to long-term memory, more or less learning, right? Have any of the folks that you work with who've had, who've had um, either substance use disorder or a lot of ACEs, do they seem like they have trouble learning, clinching that information? Yeah, is it their fault? It happens, we see it happening. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about dealing with that. And then we get into the amygdala, pretty cool word, but a lot of people get confused by it. That's emotional memory. <sighs> That's, um, you know, putting together um, the situation, the responsiveness, that's not slugging your neighbor when they whisper, like you don't slug that person because she whispered. You know, we, we go, can you quiet down or something, right? A, a, appropriate response also goes into the third one. And the third one is the prefrontal cortex, the executive function. I always think about this as, I used to have an amazing um, administrative assistant I retired, she went away, ah! So 
this is like a really good administrative assistant. Keeps your calendar, right? File stuffs for you. Okay, we went to this conference today and she talked about such and such, let's file that. Or she talked about such and such, not worth filing, put it in the trash. It's about also about judgment, not slugging your neighbor. And if somebody is talking to you at this new job we've just talked about, paying attention, at least faking like you're paying attention, right? Bosses like you to look at them. So do presenters, just so you know. <laughs> so that's kind of what goes on. And as the aces go up, these functions go down. And I think it's really important. One of the things, this is a, this is kind of a side note. Um, we, I work with Randy Ager, who um, does human services at, um, at uh, Dauphin County, and, and she and her people will go to see the judge sometimes about things like child support. And then the person will say, yes, I've got it. Yes, I've got it. I'm going to do that. And they don't do it. And they did one intervention. One intervention. Does anybody know what that intervention was to get better outcomes? Jail? <laughs> Um, no, it was a better intervention than that. <laughs> they took note cards and they had the person either themselves or with coaching write down what they were supposed to do and when. So they'd say, I'm supposed to pay $200 a week for such and such, or I'm supposed to call my kid or whatever that may be. Okay. Because hard to remember, really hard to remember. So you put little things to help. So now we're going to get into PACES, and um, PACES are positive childhood experiences, again, 0 to 17. In this case, we've got seven categories rather than 10 categories. <laughs> this is really new data, 2019. It actually came out of Baltimore, um, Christina Bethel, but the data is from Wisconsin. And if you, um, so I, I want you to know that because Wisconsin might be a little different than Baltimore. My son lives in Baltimore and he's already had one car stolen. I think it might be a little different. So seven things, able to talk, I'm starting at the left, able to talk about to family about feelings, family standing by during difficult times, feeling safe and protected by an adult, doesn't say parent, it says an adult at home, at least two non-parent adults who showed an interest in you, felt supported by friends, felt a sense of belonging in high school, and enjoyed participating in community traditions. And that idea of community tr traditions is what the person filling out the form believes is a community tradition, not what I do, because my family has very little community tradition other than eating at holidays. <laughs> so those are the, the, the categories. And I um, remember we talked about ACEs. Now, one and two to three ACEs is wiped out just to give you like a stark difference. It's not that they don't exist, but what we're looking at is far to the left, the zero ACEs, four to eight ACEs. What we're looking at, at the, on the left hand up and down is self-reported depression and poor mental health. So that's, I take this the test and I feel that I do have um, depression or I do have poor mental health. It's not based on folks like you deciding they have depression, it's what they say. Now, lots of people, if somebody told me I have depression, I would probably pair it out that I had depression, but that's not restricted to that. Um, and then we look, the green on the far right up above, zero to two paces. So is that a lot of support or not very much support? Give me a lots or less. Oh my God, they're all asleep. <laughs> Okay, I see some downs. Not much support growing up, okay? So those folks, that's green, have about a 60% chance of, I'm just gonna call it poor mental health, about a 60% chance of poor mental health. Three to five, that's kind of, they have some support, but not a huge amount of support. That's blue. And we're looking at just shy of 40%. And then with six to seven paces, this is people with lots of aces, but they also have lots of support and we're dropping down into the 20%. So the difference is four to eight um, ACEs, and I know that doesn't make sense because it's supposed to be 10, but we're going with that. 20% um, poor mental health if you've got a lot of buffering, 60% poor mental health if you don't have buffering. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, yeah. And so I think this is so fascinating because everybody in this room, I think, almost everybody said, you know about paces, but we don't know about, pa sorry, we know about aces, but we don't know about paces. And I think this is really key. Um, I'll talk later about testing, you know, doing questionnaires for this or not. Um, but it's certainly worth thinking about. And again, there's probably other ones out there that some of the studies that I saw earlier today might be similar. Um, thank you. So this is pretty much what we're talking about. Negative outcomes, ACEs, positive outcomes, or I should say negative issues lead to negative outcomes. ACEs, positive issues leave, leave, move to positive outcomes. So a scale, and I think that's fairly clear. So let's move to opioid use disorders. More than five ACEs, three times more likely to misuse pain meds. And I just wanna say, I'm giving you all sorts of numbers, like why this versus this versus, everybody's doing different testing. So honestly, in my personal opinion, high ACEs, negative outcomes. High ACEs with higher paces, less negative outcomes. Um, about 50% of people who seek Treatment for opioid use issues um, have four more ACEs. Let's talk just a little bit about screening for ACEs and PACEs. Um, does anybody screen for ACEs? Yeah, 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 a couple. Okay, so there's pros and cons. I'm not gonna get deep into this, but for those who are not screening, I want you to um, know that this is not a slam dunk. This is not a, let's throw a PHQ-9 out there. Um, you, you really have to think about this. I'm just gonna give you a couple of points. And again, you need to think about this before you make a decision. What is the benefit? What is the pro? You get information. You get to risk, you may get to risk stratify. It seems really helpful. I said seems. Um, and um, it might help the patient recognize some past history. Um, I'll also mention to you when you do a scoring, sometimes people don't give you the whole picture. And, and we're talking about people who know their history, not have forgotten their history or blocked. Um, it actually doesn't matter doing the study, doing the questionnaire actually is what makes the difference. So maybe you get an A score of two, but they really have an A score of six. Just having the conversation makes a difference. Um, so keep that in mind. But what is the negative or what's the con for doing the ACE studies? Um, it can be very re-traumatizing. It can be, um, if you don't have the right and the right amount of referral ability, and that might be you, it was never me, I was a family doctor, but if you can manage it, that takes that away. But if you can't manage it or get them to the place that they can be managed, we have a horrible mental health shortage in the United States, at least in Pennsylvania, if not all over. Um, we rarely could get people referred, and so we were hesitant. Um, and it may be seen as intrusive. Um, I've heard that with some frequency. So that's your quick and dirty on screening, not telling you to or don't to, don't do it. Very seriously think about it. And there's lots of studies. So this is also the science of ACEs. And um, when we look at this uh, pyramid, we look at adverse childhood experiences, which affects neurodevelopment, which we've talked about. Then it affects social, emotional, and cognitive um, impairment. So we talked about if somebody can't make memories, how can you remember what your boss told you? And then often health risk behaviors, if you're not doing well, might you pick up some substance? You might. And then disease, disability, and early death. You see to the far left, paces. They are a buffer if they're present. <clears throat> um, I'm not gonna go deeply into this one, but um, we need to be aware that ACEs can affect um, people's recovery. Um, again, for the same example, maybe the person's in recovery and you ask them to remember three things but they can't, or they don't know how to. Maybe you ask them to write it down and then they lose the paper. But if they keep the paper, you're in pretty good shape, right? Maybe they have emotional, their emotionality is varied and they do slug somebody in treatment. That usually doesn't work real well as far as I can tell, right? 
or they have poor judgment for any number of reasons because of the prefrontal cortex. Um, also thinking about um, systems of oppression that we have, um, of course. Uh, so that's pretty important to keep in mind. So who's heard of trauma-informed care? Okay, okay, good. So I'm still gonna touch on a couple of things. There's a lot of principles for trauma-informed care. I'm gonna provide to you the one by Fallot and Harris. Again, not the only one. It's five things. I like five things rather than 15 things. Um, what they're looking at is safety, trustworthiness, choice, collaboration, and empowerment. And I'm guessing that most of the folks in this room consider this regularly, if not daily. You think about it in terms of your environment. You know, is this a place that's um, comforting for folks, whether it be um, somebody who's especially large or especially small or somebody who's LGBTQ or somebody who's any number of things, um, that's, that's really important. And of course, you've got an overlay culture, gender and linguistic um, competence there. So this is from Dr. Anderson, um, a way to look at substance use disorder and um, trauma informed and there's a, there's a program called Seeking Safety. It's a, it's a big book here and I'll have it out front if you want it. Um, but it's flexible, it affects, it addresses trauma and addiction. So not just one or the other. And I think so often, you know, you get one book about trauma, one book about addiction and you have to figure out how to put together and guess what? Time is challenging to have that extra time. And secondly, that's not your, I mean, those are your areas of expertise, but you're not the researcher who does it. So this is one example. I'm not saying it is the only example. Um, this, this one has been used in many, many settings, as is mentioned. And so perhaps, you know, you have one, you work in one of those settings that might be something you wanna look at. Um, and she mentioned safety and, and looking at trauma and substance abuse together um, and talks a lot about, about a lot of things that I'll defer to you guys for being the experts on. So I wanna just take a minute to talk about trauma-informed language. The reason I wanna point this out is because I think, I'm just gonna say in our preschool, we don't do as well as we'd like on this. And so I'm not gonna give you any preschool examples, but um, it's hard to do a lot of trauma-informed, to do trauma-informed language well, because we go naturally to what we go naturally to, or I have kind of a quirky sense of humor and sometimes it's not the right sense of humor in those situations. So what is the goal of any communication? Understanding and listening. And so, and this pertains in general, but also, for folks with a lot of aces, how are you feeling right now? Because I might ask you, how are you feeling now? Or how are you feeling? You could be thinking about what you had for dinner last night and how good it was or how bad it was. Or you could be thinking about the fact that you're going to somewhere fun tomorrow. So using the term right now, how are you feeling right now? Okay. And then how is your body feeling right now? You know, you may be going away, your body might be feeling really nervous, but excited. I'm just making these up for you. Um, so, you know, if somebody has clenched lips, clenched fists, you could see something there. So that's some examples that might be useful for you to help with connecting with your clients. And then the discounting statements. I would love to tell you, I've never said anything like this, but I would be lying through my teeth. I know how you feel. Well, unless you lost the same person the same day in the same way, you still can't. You'll get over this. Don't say that, even though it's true. I mean, we all know we're gonna get over it, but we don't need to say that. Time heals all wounds. Um, you must go on with your life. That's all true, but don't say it. And this is meant to be. <laughs> And then some unhealthy expectations. You should be finished grieving. It's been a year since your so-and-so died. Um, you must be strong for your children, friend, whatever, dog. Um, at least you have 
another kid. Crazy. So keep those in mind. And I would encourage you, depending on your situation, to talk to your partners in, um, I mean, your colleagues about dumb things you've either heard or you've said or you thought about saying. Because you know what? We all learn from each other. We really do. Yep. So um, anybody have, anybody know anything about little kids? Anybody have any? Um, so when the child learns to walk and they fall down 50 times, does the child say to themselves, eh, not for me? What if you're, what if you're the, the parent, the grandparent, the this, the that? Do you say, oh, Junior, Junior tried 50 times. I, I checked it, you know, I put him out of here 50 times and he didn't get it, so we're putting him in a stroller. Well, why do we expect that every person will get everything the same time? And why do we expect that people will never relapse? It's like walking. It happens. Let's be compassionate, just like we're compassionate. Uh, maybe you guys are all more compassionate than I was, but when my son was having his issues, there was a shortage of compassion. <laughs> He's nice now, so I'm nicer back. But you know, let's give them the grace that they need to, to fall down 50 times, whatever that means to you. You, you decide what that means to you. Um, this is for trauma-informed primary care, but I actually think it works for everything. I'm not gonna go deeply into it because I've actually already talked about it. What is your foundation? We wanna be trauma-informed. and We wanna be trauma-informed related to substance use disorder, or if we're talking about the, the folks who are more senior, maybe about mental medical things and substance use disorder, or mental health and substance use disorder. You define that. What's your foundation? What's the environment? Are you gonna screen or not? Even if you're not gonna screen for ACEs, you're still gonna to talk to people. You're gonna find out about ACEs and PACEs and how are you gonna respond? So we've talked about neurobiology. We talked about a 20 year decrease in life expectancy. We talked about substance abuse uh, correlates with high ACE scores, correlates, it's not a cause and effect. PACEs are buffering and trauma-informed uh, makes a difference. And I'll also specifically say, let's say you put in trauma-informed principles. What about those people who don't have high A scores? Will it be all right for them? It'll be fine for all of you, including yourselves. Because I'm guessing that some of you have high A scores. I could actually predict that about 30% have an A score of one and 35% have an A score of six or above. I don't know if that's true, but that'd be approximate based on healthcare providers, higher ACE scores. So, so this is one of many references and more references. Um, if you wanna, if you wanna learn a little bit about um, general things about ACEs, the deepest well, I'll try to put this here uh, by Nadine Burke Harris. She's the physician general at, in um, California. That's a really good one. It's, it's not as heavy of a read as this one. The body keeps the score. This really gets into how ACEs affect. I see that. Um, that's, a, that's also a good read. So I'm here for any questions or comments or disagreements. Um, I see the chat. If I see the chat. I see the chat. I heard Dr. Felitti sp speak a few years back in California. At the end of his presentation, he said that he does not believe addiction is a disease. Um, he thinks it is a reaction to trauma and a coping mechanism. I have been hearing this quite a bit lately in the SUD field. The president of the something certification board for addiction counseling in my state says it often. I do not think the two things are mutually, ex mutually exclusive and I find this way of thinking disturbing and potentially harmful to our field. Any thoughts on this? Yes, I have thoughts on this. Did, were you surprised? <laughs> okay, so we saw that diabetes is more common in people with, you may not have seen that, it was in the list. Diabetes is more common, heart disease is more common. Um, hypertension is more common. Are they diseases? I think they're diseases. 
Is there a significant contribution from trauma? I believe there is, but I don't think, I mean, I, about 90% of the, I guess 90% of the diseases are probably related to trauma, you know, trauma or ACEs or whatever. Uh, maybe not, you know, you happen to be walking, well, yeah, you happen to be walking down the street and you got hit by a bus, but maybe you were walking in front of the bus so maybe that was too. So that's my opinion. I understand. Thank you for your question. Um, and uh, really worthy of conversation. Thank you. Welcome. Do we have any other questions? We have time. They told me I had to do it in time. I couldn't be <laughs> running over, so. <laughs> so I guess a question I might have, yeah. we see how well the positive helps um, alleviate the the adversive end of things. How do you bring that into communities where I think of like Philadelphia, I think of like Baltimore where I did a lot of work uh, with children. Um, how can you bring the positive into the community where sometimes that can be lacking? Um, that's a super question. And I'm gonna reference, I just did a podcast on domestic violence for Randy's House of Angels. And one of the people I, people I interviewed was Queen Afee. Um, that's her stage name, I guess. And she said repeatedly at the dinner table, at the dinner table, at the dinner table. What she meant by that is, imagine your dinner table, maybe when you were a kid, maybe now, whatever, my dinner table is me and my cat. But think about your dinner table. What did you talk about? Stuff. What didn't you talk about? Stuff. Okay, we need to have these conversations at the dinner table. We need to have these conversations elsewhere. Going back to the thing about Philadelphia and Baltimore, that's a really big question that I am absolutely not qualified to answer, but I will. Um, and that is, I think in many cases, the families and the communities can make a difference. And there needs to be some support with that. And I'm way out of my league for what that means or how that works. But I think families or, um, we know that people do better in, in settings where they feel connected. Re earlier on today, somebody said NAAA, right? What is that? That's community. Um, I have a family member who just started NA and he's got a really, um, unusual style, very unusual, uh, fairly off-putting. People in NA think he's the world's greatest guy because he's in NA. He's been clean and sober for six months because he's in NA. Could he have gotten it otherwise? He's a real hermit, it would have been hard. So whether it's NA or AA or in the African-American community, a lot of times the church, but the details, I'm gonna have to say that's beyond my capability. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes, okay. Oh, hold on, please. I think I Can you say more about where the pieces originated and when? I know you touched on it. But... Yeah, the person, the lead author is Christina Bethel, B-E-T-H-E-L-L. -L. I think, I know she's in Baltimore. I think she's at Hopkins. And if you put in positive childhood experiences or C Bethel, you're gonna get that. And there's about, I'm gonna say there's about six or eight articles now. But when you look at those articles, um, just find out in the, in the beginning of it, where the data is coming from. And the reason I say that is because, um, you know, you guys in central Pennsylvania, you actually might be closer to Wisconsin in terms of people um, than the folks in Philadelphia, but you kind of want to know who are we looking at? Who, who are these results about? And again, just figure out how to put them into place. Um, at the end of this, my email, if you want the, if you want additional articles, if you want to pace, we, we actually made our own pace questionnaire because um, people can't read that small writing. <laughs> so anybody else? Yes. Is there such a thing as a modified, let's say you're at a three, 
but in adult, as an adult, you experience war or things like that. Is and then they modify it now. It's a five. Now, is there anything such as that? The ACE is zero to seventeen. Period. That said, if this is a you know a client of yours, you could write you could write whatever you want in the chart, but you could say a score of three plus you know war and this and that. So, but the A score by definition is what happens zero to 17. So somebody else? At a podcast. So I was just wondering what's the name of your podcast? Yeah, it's, it's not about this. It's um, about domestic violence, but it is called, it was my first podcast. It was scarier than heck. It was right close to toxic stress. Um, <laughs> it's called Randy's House of Angels, R-A-N-D-I apostrophe s and we just dropped i don't even know what the right word is but we just dropped the first podcast out last week and the next one's coming out next week what a rush <laughs> anybody else thank you for staying awake i didn't see anybody with their eyes down thank you so much dr smith i appreciate it um <clears throat> just quickly i do think that uh, in looking at this and um, kind of reflecting on some of uh, my past clinical experience doing uh, crisis intervention with uh, children and adolescents in inner city Baltimore, um, the connecting to the community um, as a clinician, it can be our toughest thing to help somebody identify that one person who could be the P instead of the A um, in that group. Um, it, it can be really... Yes, please. You're perfectly welcome. Um, this brought up a memory for me. This is anecdotal, but I believe it to be true. Um, a number of folks have started to do group visits in primary care and pediatrics and stuff like that. And there's a story out there, um, probably second degree of connection to me, said they did group visits with this group of women all women in their 60s who had diabetes and they were there and they did diabetes and they talked about all the stuff that goes with diabetes. And over a bit of time, they realized they had all been subject to sexual abuse and they got deeper into the conversation, but every one of their diabetes got better. So, and I have the books here. I'll sit tight. If you want to look at the books, come by. Okay, thank you. And I'd also, I guess, uh, challenge us too to look at uh, the populations. We look at Dauphin County. Dauphin County can be very rural um, in areas and how can we connect uh, our clients to supportive places um, in rural areas as well where that can be just as much of a challenge as it can be in our more urban areas. Um, we're gonna take about a, what is our schedule? Let me come back there. 240. Okay. Okay. All righty. So we have a little bit of a break um, till 240. Please come up and look at the books. Uh, I think the Body Keep Score is a powerhouse of a book uh, that's out there. Um, and again, thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you.